Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center, I want to welcome you today to our, our book talk. Uh, my name is Clifford Muse. I'm the University Archivist and the Associate Director of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center. Uh, one, uh, during a meeting of uh, the staff, uh, it was suggested that one way we could uh, publicize the vast holdings of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center and highlight the extreme value of our resources would be to invite those researchers who have used those resources to produce publications to come back and talk about their publications. So we've been very happy to have several uh, authors come back and discuss uh, their works uh, after using the resources at the Research Center. This is our fourth in the series of book talks. Uh, the three previous authors that we had were Dr. Kate Masur. Her publication was entitled, They Knew Lincoln. Dr. Lopez Matthews, his publication was entitled, Howard University in the World Wars. And Dr. Jeffrey Stewart, his publication was entitled, The New Negro, The Life of Elaine Locke. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna find today's program very exciting. Uh, a lot of information should be very stimulating and interesting. Our speaker today is Dr. Belinda Wheeler, whose publication is entitled Heroine of the Harlem Renaissance and Beyond, Gwendolyn Bennett's Selected Writings. Uh, Dr. Wheeler will be introduced by uh, Sonia Woods, who is an archivist in the Howard University Archives. I uh, thank you for coming, and I'm sure you will enjoy this program. If at some point you use Moreland Resources and you create some type of publication, contact us and we'll set up a book talk for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Muse, for that welcome uh, today. Um, so uh, I'm very glad to have uh, Dr. Belinda Willer here to discuss her book. Uh, one of the reasons is the subject of her book was Howard faculty in the Department of Art for uh, about three years. And we've also learned, um, well, I've also learned a lot about uh, um, uh, Gwendolyn Bennett, that's who the subject of the book is. I've learned a lot about Gwendolyn Bennett just by being tasked with setting up this program. So I've had a lot of correspondence with Professor Wheeler, and um, I've learned a lot about her as well, as, and a lot about her in the last 30 minutes. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on Dr. Belinda Wheeler. As an associate professor, professor of English at Claflin University, Dr. Belinda Wheeler strives to engage and challenge every student she encounters. Originally from Australia, Dr. Wheeler completed her PhD in English at Southern Illinois University. Her research interests include Australian Aboriginal literature, African American literature, and 20th century American literature. Dr. Wheeler's research interests infuse her teaching and motivate students to see literature in a whole new light. In addition to her own publications, Claflin students have worked with Dr. Wheeler to create their own scholarship. For example, in 2015, Dr. Wheeler's English 303 Introduction to Gender Studies students met with Australian Aboriginal author Dr. Janine Lean. And the interview they conducted with her after reading her award-winning novel, Purple Threads, resulted in a publication in one of Australia's leading feminist journals, Hecate. So she's worked with her students to help them understand the, the uh, importance of primary sources and how they, in, to, using the primary sources of an archive, that they can work on their own publications, as well as using interviews and oral histories. So uh, I want to welcome um, Professor Wheeler here, and we're, we're excited to learn more about Gwendolyn Bennett and some of the writings and art that uh, Professor Wheeler has kind of uncovered or brought back to light, let's say that, brought back to light about Gwendolyn Bennett. So let's welcome her and, and sit tight and get ready for some questions in question and answer. Dr. Belinda Miller. Great, thank you so much for this uh, very warm welcome. It is such an honor to be on Howard University's campus. Um, I've devoted my career um, to teaching at HBCUs and I try to visit as many HBCUs as I can. Um, we don't have anything like HBCUs um, back home in Australia and I think that they are 
um, the, the work that the students do, you guys are all amazing and, you know, being able to, you know, be an instructor and, you know, help students realize their full potential and everything is just a blessing um, for me. So it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, you know, I've, I've worked on Gwendolyn Bennett for a number of years and I knew how important Howard University was uh, to herself, to her first husband um, and also to her father. Um, her father actually got a law degree here um, at Howard University um, in the beginning and then Bennett came here and was an instructor of art and that's where she met her first husband so Howard has been very important um, and the mission and visions of HBCUs has also been very important to Bennett over the years so to be in you know in this beautiful space and to be talking about her uh, with you is really is really a blessing so thank you so much um, to all the different um, players here um, particularly Sonia for helping me uh, you know kind of get get all this um, together. So uh, what I might do is, uh, particularly for the students, I might uh, actually just pass around a copy of the book so you can actually kind of, you know, touch it, feel it and kind of see, um, you know, see a little bit more um, about Bennett. And uh, yes, I will try to keep myself at this podium because as you've seen, I love to like move around and kind of get in between <laughs> students and talk. So I'll try to contain myself. Um, so, okay, so Gwendolyn Bennett. Um, I will mention just briefly, I came to the United States. Um, I'm from Australia originally. I came to the United States approximately 18 years ago. Um, I had a former life with a, a handmade chocolate business. Um, I picked mushrooms, I picked apples, I packed apples. I had a whole different life before I came to the United States. Um, and when I was actually taking um, some English classes, it was actually my African-American literature course that I took as an undergrad in the Purdue University system. That, um, I don't know if it literally blew my mind because I wouldn't have a, you know, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you, but metaphorically blew my mind. This, um, this amazing repository of outstanding literature, which I had had very little interaction with as an Australian growing up in a very rural community. Um, in Australia, low income community, um, books, library books were the only books I really had much of an access to. So, um, you know, and British literature, particularly white dead British literature, uh, was kind of forced down my throat, um, kind of right out of the womb, you know, when I was a child. So, you know, apart from Alice Walker's The Colour Purple um, and some kind of select texts, there wasn't a lot of um, African American literature that I'd really been exposed to until I came to the United States of America. Um, and it, um, it, it really kind of transformed who I am, I think, as a person and also as, a, as an instructor. It, um, it motivated me to learn more about Indigenous Australian uh, literature as well, um, in addition to learning more about uh, African American literature. And it was all thanks to that first class that I took on African American literature. So it's been an amazing journey. Um, and it's, it's because of this journey that I started over 18 years ago that's leading to things like this Gwendolyn Bennett book. So um, it's, I'm very passionate about this and I hope my passion kind of shows through um, with my presentation today. So. Okay, so Gwendolyn Bennett, if you don't know anything about Gwen, don't be embarrassed. Most people don't know much about Gwen until they kind of meet me or they read Sandy Govan's 1980 dissertation on Gwendolyn Bennett. Usually um, when I'm speaking about Gwendolyn Bennett, a lot of people will jump in and correct me and be like, are you talking about Gwendolyn Brooks? And I'm like, no, 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 not Gwendolyn Brooks. This is someone decades earlier, Gwendolyn Bennett. So she was born in 1902 uh, in Giddings, Texas. Uh, believe it or not, a long way away from where we're standing right now. Um, but you know, her her parents um, had lived there. They um, moved to a, a community in um, the New Mexico area for a short a short amount of time. Her mother was a teacher. Um, and they worked on the Native American communities um, for a little bit with teaching, but they soon uh, traveled to the DC area. Um, and her, um, her dad um, actually was, in addition to working full time, he was a night student at Howard University working on his law degree. Um, so that's kind of how Gwen kind of started to get some involvement with HBCUs. Um, 
let me see here. So I love this photo that we have here because, you know, Gwen is in the center. And a lot of times, you know, when, when people talk about the Harlem Renaissance, they know people like Langston Hughes, uh, County Cullen, Zora Neale Hurston, you know, these are, these are important names. And I definitely don't want to um, downplay any of those people. I simply just want to lift up Gwendolyn Bennett as someone who can be a part of that discussion. So this is a lovely, a lovely photo um, that, you know, Gwen is, and this is from the Schomburg Digital Archive. You can go onto the Schomburg website and there's a couple of Gwen's um, pictures that are actually archived and you can kind of see them there in the digital archive. So I love this picture because here she is smiling with all her friends and it really is I think an excellent kind of example of her kind of being in the in the center of everything. So one of the questions a lot of people actually first ask me is how on earth does a Australian who's now moved to the United States of America kind of know anything about Gwendolyn Bennett? Or how did you first kind of encounter her? Um, and how I encountered her was through a chapter in this book. Um, it was an edited collection with Adam McKibble and Susan Churchill, and it's entitled Little Magazine and Modernism. And there was a chapter on, let's see here, women editors and little magazines in the Harlem Renaissance. It was um, Jane Merrick's um, essay. And there's a tiny, there's like a half a sentence there where Gwendolyn Gwen is kind of listed in this long list of amazing African-American female editors who were doing great things during the Harlem Renaissance. And I was studying for my uh, prelims at that particular time at Southern Illinois, and I was like, who is this woman? Like every other person that was in this, in this chapter, in this little list here, I knew every single person, but there was this Bennett, and I was like, who is she? And I was like, you know, if, if this is going to be an area of specialization for me, if I want to be considered, you know, a decent scholar, um, you know, in African American studies as well as 20th century American lit, I was like, I need to know who she is. And it was this little, this tiny little mention in this chapter that really led me on this discovery um, of Gwen Bennett. So uh, I was talking to Sonia before and um, she herself had, had not had a lot of interaction with Bennett beforehand, which is probably very similar for a lot of you. Um, and if you Google Gwendolyn Bennett now, you'll actually find quite a lot of things, you know, via Google, which is wonderful. Um, but in 2010, um, when I was actually working on Gwen, there was not very much at all. And I'd love to see that in such a short space of time, you know, one or two Google hits is now, you know, a couple of hundred Google hits, maybe even more for Gwen Bennett. So it does seem that um, more and more people are kind of learning about her, which is wonderful. So this, um, this kind of uh, edited collection, I think, is really good because it um, people knew some things about Bennett, like she published in, let's see here, let me go up here. She published in magazines like Opportunity and Crisis, which you may be uh, familiar with, you know, the, N, um, the National Urban League and the NAACP sponsoring these, um, these these publications, these are actually two uh, drawings that Gwen actually did for the crisis and opportunity. She did, um, she was, you know, you think about the, the Renaissance woman, or excuse me, the Renaissance man, what is a quintessential Renaissance man? Uh, Gwendolyn Bennett was the quintessential uh, Renaissance woman. She, let me go back here, um, she published in, she published in Opportunity, Crisis, The New Masses, um, Fire, which I'm going to show you momentarily. She was one of the leading editors of Fire. So she did creative work like short stories, poems, um, but then she did creative work in the form of artwork, um, both graphic art and oil, uh, oil paintings. Um, she also was an educator for a period. Um, she was a magazine editor. Uh, she was doing all sorts of different things. So, you know, she really is kind of this, um, this Renaissance uh, woman. So yeah, it was finding Bennett um, back in 2010, and that kind of led me to my first um, publication in PMLA. If you're an English person, that's kind of our like major, our major journal that we're um, kind of publishing. I did a, um, a small piece for their little known document section because she had a column in Opportunity called the Ebony Flute, um, which she had for a number of years. Um, and in that Ebony Flute, she was, and I'll show you a picture of the Ebony Flute in just a moment. She was. Um, talking about all the different things that are going on in the Harlem area, in, in specifically Harlem, but around different parts of the United States of America and also abroad. You know, there'd be moments in um, the Ebony Flute where she'd be talking about um, what what kind of magazines and that are taking place, uh, what what's kind of happening in France, for example, and then she'd connect it back with what's happening in America. So, so that was my first publication. And then, um, 
Shireen Sherrod Johnson did a companion on the Harlem Renaissance, and I have a chapter in that. And I just kind of wanted you to see these, oh, excuse me, I just wanted you to kind of see these so that you knew that I had some kind of street cred, if I can kind of say that, that, um, you, know, he, you know, here's this kind of outsider kind of doing this stuff, and I wanted to kind of put these up there so that you knew that, okay, it's just not this, you know, this, this little book that I've done. There's a number of different things um, that you'll find um, about me with Bennett because she's so important. You know, there's so much, and I just, can't, I just can't let her go just yet. And I love sharing her with people because I hope that, you know, students like yourself or friends, you know, of yours may end up kind of taking up the, the Bennett baton and you know, taking taking it even further than I did. You know, I just kind of started. You know, I worked on Sandy Gove and did the dissertation in the 1980s. Um, you know, and now this is kind of a continuation of what Sandy has done. And I hope you know you or friends of yours or family members. You know, you might also you know continue on with this because it's part of this community. You know, and I think Bennett was very much a part of you know community, um, both African Americans and non African Americans. And I think I I like to kind of see that kind of continue. So um, you know, one of the things that people often ask me is you know, well, what makes Bennett so so amazing? Yeah, she hung out with Lang. And Hughes, she um, hung out with Claude McKay. What, what else is it about her? So I usually try to have a couple of different kind of bullet points up here for you to see. Um, you know, she was an early leader of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, she was at the Jesse Redmond Fawcett um, event where they um, at the Civic Club dinner um, in the early 1920s, kind of where they where they kind of showcased a lot of um, African American authors. And um, she actually read one of her poems to Oswood at the very at the very end. Um, of that meeting, you know, she championed works of others, including the names that I've just mentioned, and and Augusta Savage, Norman Lewis, um, Jesse Redmond Fawcett, um, and in the collection, you'll see that there's uh, letters and diary entries where she's kind of talking about the relationships that she has um, with these people. Um, she was a noted artist and writer in the innumerable genres that I um, just mentioned. She won a, she got an award at the World, World's Fair. Uh, for her artwork that she had done. Um, and then also another thing about Bennett, when I was working on her for my dissertation, a lot of scholars, including myself, excuse me, had thought that when Bennett had left um, Howard University, she married her husband, a medical doctor who completed his degree here at Howard, and she went to Eustis, Florida. A lot of people thought, and that was like um, circa 1928, 1929, um, that that we thought her writing and her creative work had kind of um, ended. And that was, that was a wrong assumption, including my own, um, because, you know, when you know you're a really creative person, you can't just switch it off, right? You know, you got to still be doing stuff. Um, and it's because of the archives, um, thanks to, you know, the Howard University archives, they've got... Um, some, this is the, uh, a copy of the Howard University record, and when Bennett was an art teacher um, here, she wrote um, a piece, it's a special article that was published, The Future of Negroes in Art, and that's one of the um, uh, pieces of Bennett's that's actually been reproduced in the, in the edited collection that we have here. Um, so, you know, we thought that, you know, and this was, you know, in the early 1920s, as well, and it was thanks to archives uh, like the the Schomburg that I'm going to be at tomorrow night giving a presentation, um, and the collections that they had there, where we actually found, um, you know, Bennett had published about 25 short stories, poems, um, pieces of artwork during this like early 19 1920s, late 1920s, like 21 to 28, um, and that's all people thought that she had done. Well, at the Schomburg, they have this collection and also they have a copy of it at the Armistad Research Center um, in Louisiana. Um, and they had over 50 of Bennett's poems that had been unpublished. Um, they also had diary entries. They had letters that she had written. Um, and a lot of these dates kind of push us into the late 1930s. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I think, in addition to everything else that Bennett was a part of in the 1920s that makes her really important to us today is just like Claude McKay's Amiable with Big Teeth that was just recently um, published. It was found in the archives, um, and that particular text has been credited. Um, you know, it was discovered in 2009, but Claude, um, Claude McKay 
um, wrote it like in the 1930s. Um, and a lot of people, it's, it's this kind of archival work that is helping us see that the Harlem Renaissance wasn't just a 1920s. You know, you can't just kind of pigeonhole it into the late 1910s, um, you know, 1910s to 1920s. It really goes into the 1930s and possibly even early 1940s. So it's things like Claude McKay's work. It's things like the archives with Bennett's um, poetry um, and articles and letters that really show that these really dynamic figures from the Harlem Renaissance were really pushing these kind of discussions and conversations about artistry um, way after the 1920s. Okay, so that's another reason I think um, that, you know, just as excited as people were about um, Claude McKay's um, book, you know, coming out in 2009, we should be kind of equally excited with someone like Bennett, um, you know, because, you know, she's doing equally important things, you know, during this, during this time period. So, all right, so um, I will mention just a little bit more. Um, and in the book, I think I've got a couple of other images um, of Bennett's. So her artwork, we know that she was a very well-renowned um, artist, both in graphic art and then also in oil paintings in particular. But there was a series of art, um, excuse me, house fires of her family, family members that actually destroyed a lot of her work. So I think I've got, hang on, excuse me for one second. Do I have my picture? Ah, oh, yeah, okay. So if you Google Bennett, um, this picture of her on the, on the bottom here is, this is pretty much the only known painting of Bennett's that we have with her standing next to it, okay? No one has actually been able to find this painting. It's assumed that it was destroyed in a house fire. Um, when I was at Payne College um, in 2000, and I think it was 2013, uh, eBay, of all places, uh, was looking, because I'm constantly looking for old, old uh, issues of opportunity and crisis and kind of seeing like those periodicals. I want to have like a, a collection and kind of donate a collection to Claflin or wherever I'm at. And, um, and I came across this painting. And this painting here um, is actually a Gwendolyn Bennett painting. Um, and I purchased it. I did the due diligence with uh, family members, um, art galleries, um, and we were able to uh, prove that it was indeed a Gwendolyn Bennett painting. So this particular one that I found of all places on an auction site um, is actually the only known painting of Gwendolyn Bennett in existence. But as I was saying to um, a number of my colleagues, I do believe that there are multiple paintings of Bennett's around and I'm sure you know maybe one of your family members or someone actually has one up on your wall but you just don't know that's Gwendolyn Bennett painting because most of the time when she signs, <laughs> she signs um, GBB or GB, GB or GBJ because at this particular time she was, uh, this was in 1932, this particular piece, 3132, um, and she had her married name because she was living down in Florida now. So she was known, you know, by her husband's last name. So this particular one is actually signed GBJ. So unless you kind of know what to look for, a lot of people I think don't even know that there's, that they actually are in a possession of a Gwendolyn Bennett painting. Now, unfortunately, they're not worth like millions of dollars or anything like that, um, but they're still super important, right? It doesn't matter about the, about the monetary value. It's the value to African American and American literature um, and history, you know, that we're seeing these amazing kind of pieces of artwork that Bennett does. So I'm still on the hunt, you know, <laughs> for, for Bennett work because I want to share more with everyone. And I will say that when I found this particular one, it was in pretty, it was in pretty poor shape. Um, you know, it needed to be um, restored by an art um, restorer. And at this particular time, I think I was only nine months out of my PhD program, so pretty poor postgraduate student um, here. So what I ended up doing is um, um, an art gallery um, actually put it up for sale and I believe a museum purchased it so that they could do the restoration. So I think I got like $2,000 or something like that for it. But again, it wasn't for the money. It was more of making sure it would get in the hands of someone who could restore it and take care of it because if it literally stayed in my apartment, it probably wouldn't even be in existence to today. You know, it would have deteriorated because, you know, you need the proper conditions, you know, to kind of protect pieces. So... Um, let me see. 
Okay, so some of the things that um, I wanted to kind of share with you, if I can, um, were some of the letters that, um, that Bennett had wrote to, to, wrote to friends. So, and these are also included um, you know, in, in the collection, and I think that they show the kind of close relationship that she had with a number of people. So I've got some excerpts here. Um, I try not to read um, from the PowerPoints, but I want to just kind of read a couple of little excerpts here. So we've got letters when, um, when Bennett was in France. She was a Delta. I don't know if we got any Deltas in the room, but she was a Delta and she won a Delta um, sorority um, uh, scholarship to, which enabled her to go to France um, and study at the Sorbonne and other places uh, with, with her artwork. So she was writing um, from France to people like Langston Hughes and County Cullen. And for example, she's got here, um, you know, to Langston, she says in December of 25, do send some of your poetry and never mind about whether the colored people like the Karabuas cover, not the Van Vechten introduction. You're not writing your book only for colored people, which was very interesting for Bennett because a lot of the, when you see with the artwork, some of the stuff, you know, she had some artwork that you can see here um, on the left where there's no, there's no um, non-African American people in this particular piece. It's kind of, you know, going back, we've got the modern, you know, um, African American girl, you know, you can imagine her kind of in, in Harlem, you know, going to events and things like that. But then you've also got in the background, you know, images of um, African-esque kind of images and you've got um, images that are almost like Josephine Baker-esque, you know, with the banana skirt and, and things like that. So the, the image to the left is more um, contemporary African-American appreciation of culture and then also historic. Now on the right with the crisis cover, we see both African-Americans and non-African-Americans together. Um, so you've got a non-African American person leading, you know, the choir group here, and we see an African American um, lady singing there, and I'm assuming an African, uh, excuse me, a non-African American man, where we see with the with the arm. And this was very common for Bennett to actually do. Like she always, always loved African history and culture and you know again that was one of the main reasons why she was a part of the Harlem Renaissance is because she wanted to she acknowledged the past and was appreciative of the past but she also wanted you know the new Negroes to bring forward um, you know their talents you know moving forward in the 1920s but she's also very interested in maneuvering through these spaces these um, these kind of ethnic spaces and one of the things you know with that letter is not surprising where she's saying you know Langston you know you're yes you're addressing the African American community but you're also addressing a larger a larger audience and that was something that Bennett was always um, very aware of. Um, County Cullen in her letter um, less just after a month later um, you know she's she's touching one of his um, one of his books he'd sent a, um, a copy to her and she's thinking about herself and she's you know I'm kind of wondering a bit wistful eyed whether or not um, I shall ever have a book published. You know, she had this collection and I hope, I hope Bennett is kind of looking down and looking at this and being like, yes, I finally got, you know, something, something out there. She very much, um, she had completed a collection of poetry, but at the time that she had um, completed it, it was um, in the Great Depression era where they were doing the WPA and at that particular time, Bennett was also being hounded by the FBI for communist um, activities. So just like Langston Hughes was hounded um, by the FBI and Claude McKay, um, if you go to the Schomburg, you can actually find Bennett's files. They've been digitized, so you can actually Google them now and kind of see them. But if you actually look at the physical copies of the files at the Schomburg, I think, I think Langston's file is about this thick. I think County's is about this thick. And Gwen's is like this thick. You know, it's a monster. There were like decades that they were after her. Um, and I think at the time, you know, Gwen had this collection ready, um, but I'm not sure that there was a publisher out there that was ready to kind of go forward with an actual publication of it. Because, you know, if you're seen to be supporting, you know, certain people who are, you know, targeted, um, you know, then that kind of weight can kind of come on you as a publisher and things like that. So, um, you know, she was doing these great things post-1928, which has been uncovered through the archives, and uh, unfortunately there just wasn't that space. So even before the FBI started hounding her, because this is very early in her career, she's kind of wondering whether or not she'll ever get a book published. And unfortunately in her lifetime, a book wasn't published. 
Um, and then also, I, I like this quote here from a letter from 1926 that she wrote to Langston, because at this particular point, you know, Langston is really um, building a very strong following uh, throughout the United States. And she's reading, Gwen's reading some of these, um, these comments that um, non-African Americans are saying about, about Langston. And she, she says in this letter, I don't like the idea of your being styled as busboy gone poet. I'd rather have it, quote, Negro poet finds melody in clatter of dishes, you know, and it's it's a really interesting, like it shows just how close Langston Hughes and, and Gwen, you know, were, and it's also her being very polite in kind of saying, you know, they it, it wasn't busboy gone poet, you know, you've always been a poet and you're finding, you know, as she says, melody in clatter of dishes, you know, even this most uh, menial kind of job. Um, you know, so I, I like these kind of excerpts and a lot of the letters that you see in the collection kind of show this kind of close relationship that she had with these bigger names. Um, and then also another uh, section that I think is really um, provides, it's very illuminating, I think, is the racist issues that, um, that Gwen had kind of experienced. Now, you know, yes, born in Texas, you'd think that she'd kind of encounter them a lot, but, you know, she was an infant when she was moved up to the kind of D.C. area. In the 19, early 1920s, you know, when she's, obviously there'd be some, um, you know, racism is pervasive everywhere um, all around the world. So I know that she wouldn't have been untouched by racism, um, but I know that there's moments in the book that I try to highlight where it really comes, it's front and center for Bennett. And I think it's really important to kind of see, uh, take note of those particular moments. So even when she's in France and she's enjoying this, you know, this lovely time in France and, you know, she, there's moments in her letters where she's very homesick, um, you know, for, for her friends and family um, in the DC, New York area. But there's moments where she's really enjoying her time in, in France. And there's an excerpt um, from her diary that was also in the in the archives and she says here you know we went to this delightful place um, very chic place that made me feel that I was a dream girl in a land of dreams it must have galled the Americans to death to see us there on par with them as Lewis and I danced together I heard a group of them saying amongst themselves quote they dance nicely don't they you know they have that native rhythm so here's a moment where, you know, as Bennett has kind of talked about, you know, a dream girl in a land of dreams. And then, you know, there's moments like this that kind of bring things kind of, uh, you know, crashing down in some ways. Now, you know, the way that she is talking about it, I think she's kind of putting it in a... Um, I don't think it's necessarily making her down in the dumps, this particular thing. I think she's making it kind of... When she says things like... Um, you know, it must have galled Americans to death to see us there on par with them. Because, you know, at this particular time in the 1920s, you know, there's still areas where African Americans cannot go um, as the, in the same areas as a lot of um, Caucasian Americans. So, you know, it's just, again, just kind of these interesting moments that, you know, even in France, we're kind of seeing where, um, you know, moments of racism can kind of come in. And if you've seen, if you read any of Gwendolyn Bennett's short stories, there's two that we have for... Uh, full stories of Wedding Day and uh, Tokens. Um, and they're both in the collection um, and they're set in France. Um, and there's, there's definite overt racist, of, uh, racist themes um, that are in there. And I think this kind of, um, this diary entry makes us, is further evidence that in addition to the short stories and some of the poetry that she's writing at this time period, she's thinking about her space as an African-American woman, you know, remembering about it in, in America and these characters in these, uh, particularly Wedding Day, is, a, um, is an African-American um, soldier who is over in France and um, him kind of negotiating or trying to negotiate a very troubling space um, in France. I highly recommend that you um, take, take a look at it. And some of those might actually be available on the web too uh, for my students who um, may not be able to get a book right away. Um, so, you know, she's doing chronologically speaking, you know, she's, um, she's, in, she's in France, she's got the uh, Delta Scholarship, she comes back to the United States of America, and FIRE is one of the, um, the publications that she's a part of. Um, how many of you, by a show of hands, have actually familiar or heard of the, of the magazine FIRE? 
Okay. Oh, just a couple. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, you know, Fire, if you haven't um, seen a copy of it yet, I, I'm sure in the archives here we may not have an original copy, but you'd probably have one of the reproductions um, of Fire. Amazing text that came out um, with a number of editors, including um, Langston Hughes, but Ed Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I'm just trying to think of all the people. Amazing, amazing group of people. Gwendolyn Bennett was also a co-editor of FIRE. Now, ironically, um, and those of you who, um, who know FIRE, please indulge me for a second while I, while I share this with the students who aren't familiar with it, but you know, it was supposed to be this journal like Crisis or Opportunity that's you know, publishing new Negroes and really pushing the envelope with kind of the subjects that are kind of discussed. Um, Cordelia the Crude is one of the um, short stories about a prostitute. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston has, um, I think, Sweat is in this one. Um, Bennett publishes um, uh, wedding day where it's um, the African-American soldier who's over in France is going to marry a white prostitute. Um, these are kind of texts that, you know, a lot of people would be scratching their head. I imagine, uh, and I know that I've seen um, documents, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois would be scratching his head like, what am I reading here? You know, I you know, wrote The Souls of Black Folk, you know, only a couple of decades before and now I'm reading about Cordelia the Crude and prostitutes and, you know, um, so it was supposed to be a monthly journal, journal that was um, going to or quarterly, they hadn't really figured out the logistics yet. And unfortunately, they, they um, published a number of the editions and uh, it was a fire. It was actually a literal fire that burnt down the repository of magazines that they had. And all the co-editors had kind of chipped in with at least $50 each. You know, Gwen had put $50 each in, um, Zora had put $50 in, um, and you know, they were just like, we can't, we can't fund you know, a whole new printing again. So if you actually happen to find a uh, first edition of fire. Um, I don't know if you could pay off, you could probably pay off a full, a full semester or a full year of tuition at Howard if you found one of those, so you might want to keep an eye out uh, for them. But um, amazing, amazing um, publication that really um, pushed the envelope. And I remember one of the reviewers was like, I just finished reading a copy of fire and I put it in its, I put it in the rightful place. I threw it into the literal fire that he had burning, you know, um, a fireplace. He's like, I read it, I consider it filth, and I threw it in the fire. Um, so am amazing text that really kind of showed what a lot of these really dynamic people that we consider as real uh, major figures of the Harlem Renaissance really pushing the envelope because they were the editors. You know, they didn't have someone else, um, you know, kind of overseeing um, the texts that were published. So again, I'd mentioned earlier Howard University, her father had got a law degree here. She was an art, um, an art professor here at Howard University um, in, the, in the 1920s, and she, she loved being at Howard. Um, there's a couple of, in the Schomburg, we've got a couple of letters with the Howard um, letterhead, you know, where she's writing to people like W.E.B. Du Bois and, and um, people like that, which is such a treasure. And I think she would have continued her entire career possibly at Howard, but it was very controversial for her to be dating a student. Uh, even though he was a, uh, a, medical, a medical student and she was an art teacher, uh, still kind of taboo. So um, she was asked to resign uh, from her position as an art teacher, which she did. Um, and her husband ended up finishing his degree and then he moved down to Eustace, Florida and started his own practice. Um, and eventually, um, you know, Bennett went to, um, let's see, I'm just trying to think. Uh, she went to, is Pennsylvania. Excuse me for one second. She was trying to get some money together because, you know, she went from a full-time job where she didn't think she was going to, um, where she didn't think money would be be an issue, and all of a sudden she's like, "You need to leave. Um, you know, you need to leave our um, institution." Uh, Yet yeah, she went to the Albert C. Barnes, uh, the Barnes Foundation in Marion, Pennsylvania, for a period, and then she also went to Tennessee State University for a summer, and she taught art there. So, uh, and she was actually going to teach um, when she was in Florida, at Eustis, Florida. She'd actually made plans to teach at Bethune Cookman. Um, so another HBCU, um, but because of the Mediterranean fruit fly and also because of overt racism that took place and the, we're starting to see the, the, um, you know, the Great Depression kind of moving to different areas too, that they actually ended up leaving, uh, leaving Florida. But you know, HBCUs again were very much a part of um, 
Um, I don't know if she ever really thought of herself teaching at a PWI. It didn't seem to be anything kind of in her DNA that she was interested in. She was very much interested in, you know, educating African Americans and even later on in life uh, where she uh, worked with the um, with the Arts Guild in Harlem and stuff like that. She had the um, Democratic, excuse me, the School for Democracy, uh, where she was a, a leader in that organization, you know, very much being a part of um, the African American community. So I wanted to kind of give a shout out to Howard and Tennessee. And I use this PowerPoint at other, other places too, and I want to reinforce to the other places that I go to, you know, I'm going to be at Hofstra University on was today, Tuesday, Thursday, you know, and emphasizing, because she lived in Long Island for a period, but, you know, just saying, you know, like she was, you know, she was committed to Howard, she was committed to um, Tennessee State University, and again, she was going to teach at Bethune-Cookman, uh, but it just didn't work out um, for her. So how am I going on time here? Do, um, do I want to just continue with a little bit of biography and then go into the, into the Q&A, or? Okay, um, so let me just see what I've got here. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so let me, I won't go into as much detail with this, but um, she had poetry that we knew of, like in the early 1920s, like to Uswood, that she, that she read at the Civic Club dinner, and also Sonnet 2. And I won't go, I won't read all of these, but, you know, Sonnet 2 was all about, you know, um, some things are very dear to me, such as, as such as such things as flowers bathed in rain, you know, so these like beautiful picturesque moments, you know, these were her kind of poems that she was writing. Or then to Uswood that she read at the Civic um, Club dinner and was also simultaneously published in Opportunity and Crisis um, not, not long after the Civic Club dinner um, event, she talks about um, the legacy of African Americans and you know what what they have done for the African American community, like people like Du Bois, um, Johnson, James Walton Johnson, other people. Um, but then she's also saying, you know, look, um, if if any have a song to sing that's different from the rest, so you think about, you know, Langston Hughes, her and others, oh, let them sing before the urgency of youth's behest. So she's like, I acknowledge the past, I'm grateful for the past, but you've also got to let these younger voices that are interested in sharing their message with others, you've got to also let them have a voice as well. So those are kind of two of her very um, prominent themes in a lot of her work. She has a beautiful poem uh, to a dark girl, which is, um, I recommend that you take a look at that. That's also in the collection, but you know, she's talking about the African-American body and how beautiful it is, um, that, that beautiful space. It's just, so those are kind of themes that are prevalent in her work. And then later, I'll show you in just a moment, um, her poetry from the 1930s is very different. Um, so again, you know, 20s, the ebony flute, she's talking about, yay, you know, these are some of the things that are going on, you know, um, uh, let's see, County Cullen is off, you know, doing this, uh, Jean Toomer is off doing this, you know, there's a, there's a literary contest that's taking place, I want to let all African Americans know about it, whether you're in, you know, Harlem or not, you know, you need to be applying, you know, for this competition and, and sharing your stuff, and the Ebony Flute um, is very pro-American um, culture, and also just she speaks to everyone, like, it's not like you need a PhD to read the Ebony Flute, you know, she's like, it's, it's kind of, some people have kind of called it like chit chat, or like a chit chat column. And I think with the ellipses that she has in here, you know, she'll talk about this and then she, there's no transition. Sometimes she'll just go into another thing and on another note and on another note. So it's kind of got that chit chat kind of um, um, reasoning that people have kind of, you know, labeled it that. But in my PMLA piece, I kind of talk about, you know, you can't just dismiss it as literary chit chat. It's actually a very um, important text that is communicating very important things to the readership, you know? And she also talks about, you know, literary communities that are popping up in DC. Um, Georgia Douglas Johnson, you know, her, her little literary soiree that she has on the Saturday Nighters and, and other communities in LA and things like that. So she's letting the community know that you don't have to be in Harlem to be a part of the Renaissance, right? You know, you can be, you can be anywhere in the country and you can still have an important voice. So Ebony Flute, I think, is really important for that. Um, and, you know, this was one of the examples that she talks about, um, you know, by the same token that American Negroes are writing new books and publishing magazines, you know, there's a new magazine that's been published in French, uh, in Paris, France, and, you know, she says this committee announces its aim to be the preservation of the colored race to combat prejudice and to tighten the attachment of the Negro colonies to France. 
And that's what the editors of the magazine proclaim. And then in the final sentence she says, this is in direct line with the new race consciousness among colored people of intelligence in America. So she's like, this is what's going on in America and it's important, excuse me, this is what's going on in France and it's equally as important, um, you know, what we're doing here in America, right? So, and showing that kind of community, like letting people know what's going on, that it doesn't just have to be in the United States per se, that there's other communities around the world that are very passionate um, about this. So I told you about the paintwork in the 1930s. Now, thinking about racism in France, and this is another reason I think that she ended up leaving, uh, leaving Florida, yes, it was the Mediterranean fruit fly that, that wiped out a lot of the crops and then people had no money because there were no crops. We have the Great Depression, um, but also her husband, even though he has um, the status of a doctor and has the income of a doctor, there's still overt racism. And um, in a lot of her letters and diary entries, she's talking about, you know, patients, her husband's patients would go to a pharmacy and try to have a prescription filled. And, you know, the chemist would be like, you know, we're not going to, um, we're not going to dispense, um, you know, the prescriptions of this end doctor, um, you know, to, to patients. So, you know, so many challenges. Um, and this is an example um, of an incident that happened with the KKK uh, in Florida. And I've got just a short excerpt here. It's in, published in full length in the, um, in the collection. But she says here, we could see the slowly approaching procession when they were just opposite the front door of the house, they came to a stop. Road lights were played directly upon the front of our house. They began to climb over the sides of their cars. Um, there must have been a dozen hooded clansmen stepping onto the little rise of ground that served as a pavement before one entered our front yard. Um, it was just about 10 feet now from the front porch. This is the first man. The first clansman turned, making a gesturing motion to his clumsy, sheeted arm to someone who had remained in the car. We could translate his unspoken words. This is the place. Um, so in the... You know, and you, you have her and her husband looking through the curtains, you know, at this kind of taking place. And you can feel um, that anxiety that her and her husband, you know, are facing and seeing this kind of happen. And um, for whatever reason, um, and it, uh, it goes into it in, in more description in the edited collection, the, the Klansmen actually see a, a, a tree. I forget, I forget the exact name of the tree. It was like a white cherry blossom or something like that. And it's, I guess it's not usual to the South. And they actually all stopped in their clan's gear. And they, one of them actually pointed over to the tree. Um, and they all just stopped. You know, they're about to go into her house and do unspeakable things to her and her husband. And they just all stop for a moment and they look at the tree. And they just like complete silence, Bennett talks about. And like two minutes later, they compose themselves and they jump back in their car and they go off and they actually go attack someone else. So I don't know, you know, I don't know. Um, but it's, yeah, I just don't even know what to say about that, that level of racism. But thank God for that tree at that particular moment um, because um, Bennett actually talks about there was a gentleman who um, was seeing, I think, a white woman, an African-American man who was seeing a white woman. And I think, um, I'm not, they, they didn't kill him, but they they did really unspeakable things to him. So they, they came to her place um, to kind of put the, um, put the doctor and his wife in their place. And fortunately, they got distracted by a tree and they decided to move on you know, elsewhere. But unfortunately, they did go on and do something uh, awful to someone else. But these are the kind of things that she's kind of encountering. Um, so, you know, they leave Florida and at this particular point, Bennett was not very excited about being in Florida and, you know, when you're, when you're encountering the things that they are with the KKK, um, you know, she went to the library and um, down in Florida and first they let her check out books and, um, you know, Bennett was more light skin complexion um, and I don't think someone had, a, had necessarily assumed her to be African American and then when it was actually known that she was African American, they revoked her. Um, her privileges at the library. So lots of problems that she's encountering and her husband is in, encountering a lot of problems. He's starting to drink a lot because his, of his frustration um, that he's facing there. Um, so they move back to Harlem and Bennett is so thrilled. She's like, yes, I'm finally going to get back, you know, to, uh, to the DC area, to, you know, to literally the streets of Harlem and see my friends. Um, she'd made some trips back in that time that her husband was, you know, full time at the, um, at the doctors um, in Florida. She actually, at the Schomburg um, that I'm going to tomorrow night, um, 
she did some readings with County Cullen and others, and she was so excited to be back. Um, but of course, by this particular point, the Great Depression is sweeping through Harlem. Um, and in her, in her diary entries, uh, one of her entries is, um, I cannot begin to describe the shock I received you know, coming back to Harlem. I'd been in the South and seen their poverty among Negroes and had steeled myself against it with the feeling that if I could only return to Harlem, there again I would find warmth and laughter. You know, because again, she was in the center um, of the Renaissance that was taking place. You know, date, so when she's back, you know, Harlem itself seems shaken to this, the same type of shock that I had been experiencing in Florida. Dazed, I went to some of the old haunts where they still existed. I found no gathered group of intellectuals, but rather the angry mutterings of Negroes who had come to seek the reason why. I stayed indoors. I did not want to see it. I did not want to believe it. Where was Harlem? So, you know, Bennett's, Bennett's back. She's like, yeah, I'm finally back. And she's distraught. You know, she's like, where, where is this community? You know, this, uh, and it wasn't that long. You know, she left in 28. This is only a couple of short years. You know, the time of your degree that you're doing here in Howard, you know, imagine, you know, leaving your home, you know, um, California, you know, um, other places around the country and just imagining it being completely kind of decimated in some ways and you know even seeing your friends but your friends just being totally devastated you know just everything is different so you know Bennett is just is so devastated so then she starts you know the um, she's she um, really starts to work on education. That's another part of Bennett's life. So here she is at the, um, the School for Democracy. She's in the center there with you know, pupils and others around her. She starts protesting at a lot of uh, rallies, um, you know, trying to get more funding you know, for the arts and things like that. So Bennett kind of starts moving into, although she's still publishing, uh, excuse me, though she's still writing poetry, um, she's doing a lot more when it actually comes to uh, civil engagement you know, in, in, the Harlem, in the Harlem community. And one of the poems that um, has been republished a couple of times, I found it, Carrie Nelson um, at the University of Illinois. Uh, he is a big modernist scholar and he did a big uh, collection on modernist poetry and I shared this poem with him and he's like, I want it and we need to get it published in here. I often use it as a companion to Langston Hughes's I To America. Um, it's a very long poem and um, I only have excerpts of it here, but it is a full-length poem in the collection. But I'll just read just a couple of stanzas so that you can get, a, get an idea of it here. Um, I build America, mortared brick on brick, and in with each I lay, the heart of all my brothers, dead from coast to another sea, mixed with gravel and cement and sand, I turn the powdered bones of all the dead who lie from Canada to Mexico's warm gulf. I am the dead building America. Um, let's see here. I am the topsoil strewn over storm-tried Florida, where I, a thousand strong, lay piled against a morning day. It is my last breath, sowing th through that burning coal, mind where the shaft fell. That riddled thing, lowered by weeping Negroes from a lynching tree, was me. That dangling scalp, hanging from a red skin's belt, was mine. The red man, the black man, the white, lying end to end beneath cities and towns and riverbeds and under docks, whose dust is mingled yet with farm and field and growing grain for food or cloth, are one with me. I died a thousand strong, a million strong, in a thousand different places, pioneering on battle fronts, in skies at the land of brother citizens, by lynch ropes and with police clubs, I died building America. So this is a poem that's very different from, you know, the earlier ones that are talking about, you know, the beautiful, you know, uh, moonlight and, you know, the beautiful African-American female body and sensuous and very, um, to us would, very positive kind of anthems, you know, uniting the African-American community. This one she's bringing together, you know, um, the red, the black, the white, but you can see that in the building of America, you know, what has been lost, you know, in, in this building of America. So, yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So, and another one that she that she has, which I won't go into, but Threadney for Spain. You know, she talks about the Spanish-American War. You know, and that's another thing that I think Claude McKay's amiable with big teeth has um, received a lot of traction because he's talking about you know what's happening in other yep in other cultures and things like that. So I won't read that one, but that's another example um, of of Bennett's work. So there you go. <laughs> That's my little snapshot of Gwen uh, for you. So I think I'll take questions yes, at this um, particular. You can stay yep. up there. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that, and, and, and we're able to develop, sorry, thank you, sir. And we're able to develop some questions in your mind that you might want to pose to uh, Professor Wheeler. Uh, does anybody have any questions or any comments? Yes, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Marquise Taylor. I'm a junior history major here at Howard University. And I have a quick question for you um, as to kind of what inspired you to use certain, um, I guess, pictures of Gwendolyn Bennett. Um, I'm very familiar with Gwendolyn Bennett. I'm from New York City. I did research at the Schomburg Center. I looked at her collection, and this is, this is one of my favorite pictures of Gwendolyn Bennett out of that entire collection. It's a very expansive collection of her yeah. photographs. Yep. Um, so I'm just interested to know, and then I looked at your book and some of the other pictures, those are like my favorites. So kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, that's actually, um, I'm glad you actually mentioned the photos because um, Sonia had asked me like how big is the repository at the Schomburg and I was like, well, when it actually comes to the papers, it's pretty small, you know, like the papers itself with, with the exception of the FBI files, you know, her actual, what's left of her, you know, poetry and letters and things like that is quite small, but the photograph collection is amazing. You know, there's, there's a number of photos and um, I would have liked to have had more in the edited collection, um, but it was, uh, it's not cheap to get Bennett's, Bennett's work. The Schomburg has worked really well with us. You know, they could have charged us probably $100,000, for example, for, um, for copyright permissions of, you know, because they, they are the, um, the guardians of, of Bennett's archive. So um, we worked with the Schomburg and Penn State University Press, and I think we were allowed like six um, six images that we could do in this particular um, book. And then it was kind of hard, you know, like, well, what, what will you use? Um, and, you know, we thought that we definitely had to have at least one or two of the magazine covers because, you know, that's an, um, an excellent part of her, um, her work that was really important to her. And I also wanted to do the reproduction of the, um, of the painting that I found of Bennett's because I thought since it's the only known painting of Bennett's today that it would be really good to have that um, in there. But we only have I think with the exception of this one, there's one of her as a young, as a young girl, and I, there's that other picture of her at the center. I think they're the three kind of Bennett snapshots, you know, that are in the collection, and that was hard. Um, and Louis Parascandola, who's the co-editor of this, he's at Long Island University. He's a, um, he's a Caucasian um, scholar, but he does a lot of stuff with African American uh, work. He and I were just kind of poring over these, of these photos, and um, this one, I, I got the winning vote on this one, and Penn State University Press really liked it, and Lewis was like, yeah, sure, and I like this one because it shows different sides, you know, of Bennett, like literally, you know, like an angle shot and things like that, and a lot of the, the photos that you see of Bennett on Google, there's actually a couple of that are out there that are clearly not Bennett, but they're marked as Bennett. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, like that's so not Bennett. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I like this one because it's, you know, a candid kind of old school, you know, I don't even know if they have those little machines now where you can take the, the little snapshots like that. If you do, they're not as common as they were back then. Um, so, you know, I kind of I like that one there. Um, and then the earlier photo of her when she's sitting, I think she's like nine or 10 at the time. Um, I like that one because it's, it's Bennett before she kind of became what I consider, oh, Bennett, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then the one with her and the group I really like because, again, it's her in the center. And I wish, I hope, I'm still trying, please, someone bring it down from the heavens. I would love to see a photo of her with, you know, County Cullen, you know, Langston Hughes, you know, kind of in that center. And we haven't, we haven't seen that one yet. So I would love to have one of those. Um, but yeah, it was it was a hard it was a hard decision to kind of figure out you know okay you got three images that you can kind of have as Bennett kind of portraits and what would those be so I did the individual you know this one that's the strip on the cover then I did an early shot pre you know Harlem and you know she had one marriage that failed I, I didn't mention her her first husband um, became a major alcoholic um, was having multiple affairs and he ended up dying um, in the in the early 1930s, and she, her second husband was actually a Caucasian um, American, and they had a very, uh, very long, happy um, marriage to one another. Um, when she retired to Pennsylvania, they had an antique store and things like that. And I thought about, you know, a picture of her with her first husband or a picture of her with her second husband, but I just wanted kind of Bennett herself, you know, except for when she was with, you know, this kind of Harlem community, um, because her first, her first marriage was. It started with so much 
passion and intensity and excitement and it became such a failure for her in so many ways. Um, and the second marriage was good but there was so much history that had come before it that I was like, ah, I don't know about it. a picture of either of you know, her with her husband. So I don't know if that really answers your question but yeah, there's, there's a great collection of her, of her uh, photos at the Schomburg and I'm hoping you know, with a grant, like an NEH grant or something like that, we might be able to digitize more because the ones that we chose for the book and we paid the fees for it are now available on the collection. So this little one that's um, on the front cover, you can now actually pull from the Schomburg archive and you can use it as your wallpaper or something like that, but it took someone to pay the fee for it to then actually be digitized. So it's gonna take a while to get those. Yeah, cause it's so expensive, you know, or it's time consuming, you know, as you know, digitizing, you know, stuff in the library, it takes a lot of time. So, but maybe I could write a grant and get some more. Yeah, up there, yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad that you saw the Bennett Archive. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you for that question. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Yes, ma'am, in the back here. Hold on, let me get the microphone to you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about her relationship with Elaine Locke? Uh, and also, what happened toward the end of her life? Where, where did she die? Where, you know, what, yeah, yeah, what thank you. Um, it's always, you know, when you're doing these things, like how much do you go into, uh, into detail? So, okay, so Elaine Locke, we have um, in the collection, um, there's a couple of, um, let oh, thank you. There's a couple of letters, uh, communication where Bennett had written uh, to Elaine, particularly where she was, um, she was being targeted, you know, by the FBI for the communist sympathizing, and she was writing to him hoping for letters of support um, and things like that. So there's evidence through the letters that they had a pretty, um, a pretty solid relationship with one another because the kind of rhetoric that she's using in the letters kind of shows a, a level of familiarity um, with one another. Um, when it comes to actual documentation of the two of them being in spaces together, that I have not been able to uncover as yet. So we've got the letters there. Um, and I've been talking to a number of different Elaine Locke scholars to kind of see, because um, a lot of the stuff I'm finding with Bennett, which happens to be in other collections around the country, um, is often in miscellaneous or just simply miscatalogued. Um, because again, Bennett isn't considered, you know, a, a leading figure, you know, like when I was at, um, where was I? I forget where I was, Emory? No, University of Texas, that's right. I was doing something on Australian Aboriginal literature. Um, and then there ended up being this letter, um, it was so miscatalogued. It was a Langston Hughes original, <laughs> and it was in a miscellaneous thing. And I, it was like, and I actually had another issue like that with, uh, with Emory. And Emory has a lot of resources, and they don't usually miscatalog anything. Um, and yet, yeah, two instances where I found, you know, and you know, your breath stops and you're like, hang on, got to go tell the librarian right away. And then they're like, oh, okay. And then they, you know, collect it and then they start, you know, putting it in the place. That doesn't happen with Gwendolyn Bennett material right now. So if someone sees it, they're like, oh yeah, you know, and then just kind of go over. So I think that there is material available in the archives, which will show a closer, a closer association um, between Gwen and Elaine Locke. Um, but, you know, there's more of her communication and documentation with her and W.E.B. Du Bois, for example, than there is with Locke. Um, but again, I think it is there. We just haven't, it just hasn't been catalogued the right way, or maybe someone has it in a box in their, you know, in their attic and they just don't realize that it's something of value. But I, um, based on the few letters that we do have that were found in the Elaine Locke collection, um, it does seem that there was um, a definite level of familiarity and that she could reach out to him and felt a level of comfort that she could reach out to him when she is being highly maligned and targeted that, you know, she reached out to him as a source of, you know, possible like a lifeline to kind of help. But yeah, I wish I had more information about that, but unfortunately at the moment I don't. Um, I do have a second book contract with Mississippi Press for a more um, substantive um, kind of um, analysis of Glenn, Gwendolyn Bennett's work. And I'm kind of hoping that the momentum from this particular book will actually let more people know out there. Cause you know, I'm talking to people, um, you know, who are scholars but I'm also doing some programming just with general members of the community and I'm hoping that um, as I'm working on that book that I might be able to kind of as a community kind of uncover some other material you know for it. Um, as for your second question um, about the second part of her life so she um, you know she worked with the consumer um, let me see here 
I want to make sure I don't mispronounce or miss. I've got a, I've got a really nice timeline at the beginning of the book, which I think has really helped um, a lot of people understand a bit more um, about Bennett. So she marries um, Crosscup, her husband, in 1940. She's working at the Harlem Community Arts Guild in 41. She has a falling out with Augusta Savage um, during that period. She's doing the School for Democracy, the George Washington Carver School, Consumers Union. These are like the 60s, uh, excuse me, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and it's while she's uh, in the 60s where she's working with the Consumers Union. Her second husband had um, had family and friends kind of in the um, in the Pennsylvania area, and they started doing some um, vacations kind of there. And then they started thinking about, look, how about we kind of leave the rat race, so to speak, and just kind of time out and, you know, have a more simpler life. So they moved to Pennsylvania uh, in the early, I think it was 1970, or is it? Yeah, in 70, they moved to Kuzikstown, um, Pennsylvania, which I'll be there at the university at the end of this month because uh, interestingly, a lot of people who I got to meet some people and talk with them on the phone who knew Bennett in Pennsylvania. And when I was telling them that I was working on a Bennett book, they're like, why are you writing a book about Gwen? You know, she had an antique store with her husband, but what's so interesting about that? And then I told them about her whole life, you know, in the Harlem Renaissance and they're like, I had no idea, you know? so. Gwen didn't publicize, you know, all the, like at this point she's still taught, before Langston Hughes passed away, you know, they're writing to each other, they're spending Christmases together, you know, they're doing all sorts, of, and she doesn't kind of gloat or anything like that. She has a very different, quiet life in the antiques industry, um, you know, and um, so yeah, people who knew her in Quizzickstown, and when they knew about this book and I'm contacting them, they're like, what? And then they, they've been very excited to learn about her because they're like, we had no idea. She was a good friend of ours. You know, we bought antiques from her. You know, this is a table that I bought from her and Dick, you know, 30 years ago or or whatever. And they're like, I had no idea that she, uh, and I'm hoping, you know, when I go to Quizzickstown and I meet some of the community members um, that, you know, they might be like, oh, you know, I've got this old painting, you know, maybe it's a Gwen painting or I've got some letters, you know, or, and then that way, you know, then I can reach out to Howard or Schomburg or something like that and we can get those things in the archive, you know, so that more scholars, you know, such as yourselves can do some more work. So she, she had this very quiet um, existence um, in the 70s. Um, her husband, Dick, passed away in, was it 79? 80. He passed away in 80 uh, and she died in 81. So it wasn't much long after. Um, so she, she was really devastated because her whole, her whole world essentially was Dick in, um, in Pennsylvania. And then when he passed unexpectedly, her health hadn't been very good. And when I talked to Sandy Govan, um, who was at uh, University of uh, North Carolina, um, and I'm still in communication with her today, um, she actually got to meet Gwen once when she was working on her dissertation. Um, and she didn't, you know, um, Sandy didn't realize how much like on borrowed time she was when she actually met Gwen, um, the time that she met her and uh, she planned on going back to see her and you know, the next thing she knew Gwen was gone too. Um, and unfortunately, um, Gwen's closest living relative, which is Dick's daughter from his first marriage, who now lives in Rhode Island, um, a lot of the, they were still in communication with Gwen, um, but when Gwen died, I think her, um, her closest relative didn't find out until like a week later, like they, it wasn't like they communicated on a weekly basis or anything. So a lot of um, Gwen's stuff was just sold at auction, um, you know, and apparently Gwen had a whole bunch of, like she had a library in her house that had, you know, first editions that were signed by Langston and County and all that kind of stuff. and. We don't know where they are. Sandy said that um, Gwen had said, oh, I've got a bunch of paintings off of my attic that I'd show you. But at this point, you know, Sandy, um, she, she has um, some illnesses and she wasn't able to get up on the ladder. And I think Gwen, you know, was like, eh, it was too much for Gwen to do it. So Sandy was like, oh, next time I come, you know, I'll t you know, make sure I bring someone and, you know, we can go up into the attic and see, you know, what's there. Well, by the time, you know, Sandy went back, everything was sold, everything was gone. And we don't know where that stuff yeah, where that stuff is. So it's a, it's a fact-finding mission, and I hope that this motivates more people. You know, I've had a lot of people from different parts of the country, you know, reach out now and um, are like, oh, you know, this is really interesting. And it's, it's a really nice community that we're kind of building. You know, no one's territorial over their information. It's like we try to share as much as we possibly can because, you know, this is just 
I'm hoping that, you know, 50 years from now, um, there'll be a, or whenever, there'll, there'll be another collection and maybe it'll be like an eight volume set or something because we'll just find so much stuff, you know, of Gwen's, but, you know, we'll see. This is a start, you know, yeah. yeah. Time for one more question. Okay, time for one more question, okay. I'll, I'll take the question if that's okay with everybody. Um, so, you, yeah, you said that this is a start, and I think it's an excellent start, it, Thank you. primarily because it's a group of primary sources, mm -hmm. and then you give us a good timeline, so yeah. it's like a toolkit almost yes. to build, you know, different spokes in the wheel of Gwendolyn Bennett literature. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate it. I look forward to looking into it a little bit deeper mm -hmm. and to, you know, Look out for her, actually. Yes. Like, like yes. you said, I like the way you you um, advise the audience to look at paintings and mm -hmm. see if you see a GB yeah. or a GBB or yeah. a GBJ, and you might come, you might be onto something. So, mm -hmm. um, we'll just have to keep keep an eye out for her um, yeah. amongst our, our resources here. Yeah. Um, my question was, you, you, know, you, you are talking about a grant. Uh, you talked about a grant that you're going to get, and you also talked about the uh, planning for the, your next book. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any other plans beyond that uh, for other publications, Gwendolyn Bennett rela related or not? Um, yes, I, uh, I'm always thinking about the next book project when I'm working on one. Um, I'm always thinking um, of the next one. So, yeah, so... Um, I want to do, so there's the next one with Mississippi Press. I actually uh, want to do something with Ann Spencer. Yeah, 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 she, she's my next one because um, I think, you know, a, lo a lot of you probably already know who Ann Spencer is, um, so she at least has that name, whereas Gwendolyn Bennett necessarily didn't have that name. Um, but there's so much about Ann Spencer that we don't know that needs to, you know, um, <clears throat> needs to come out. And the one gentleman whose name escapes me who wrote the first full-length text on Ann Spencer, he was working with the estate um, to work on a second text and he um, passed away unexpectedly um, just a couple of years ago so that kind of um, scholarship has um, seems to have ended and I'm not sure if anyone has reached out to the estate yet I was going to um, actually reach out to the estate myself um, and I was going to give them a copy of the of the Gwendolyn Bennett book and kind of show them the kind of stuff that I do um, and maybe um, we could you know work something out where um, I, I just think it's really important that Anne Spencer's work become known. And any of you who you know are academic or are thinking of academia, like we don't make any money out of these things. Uh, we do them because we love them. And you know, for the few copies that sell for the Anne Spencer one, excuse me, like maybe we could donate it because her 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 house, Anne Spencer's house. I don't know if you've been uh, to it in Virginia. It has beautiful gardens. Um, you know, and you know maybe um, money from the book or whatever could go back to the um, go back to the house. So Anne Spencer is definitely on my radar. I think there's some more to be done with. With Bennett but um, just like this particular this particular book was with Lewis um, and again he's at Long Island University um, the one book that I'm going to do um, maybe by myself, maybe Sandy, maybe Lewis, maybe someone else. Um, I think with more of the Bennett stuff as I move forward, I would like to work in partnership with other scholars because I think um, I don't ever want to be authoritative, you know, and be like, you know, this is my territory, you know, don't, I always want to be working in, you know, communication with other, you know, other people. So, you know, if there was an undergrad who was like, hey, you know, I want to do this, and since I've got a bit of a reputation as being a Bennett scholar, if there's some way that I could kind of help, you know, just like when you were reading my biography and how I helped the students, you know, do that uh, interview, you know, with um, Janine and it got published, I'm kind of interested in kind of helping students, you know, do that kind of, um, that kind of stuff too. So I think if there's some, some things that, you know, students or other people are interested in, maybe working in partnership with them, whether it's with Bennett or other people. But yeah, as, as an actual text, Ann Spencer is definitely uh, the next person, I think, after Bennett. It. But yeah, I'd be interested in, you know, like the one gentleman just there had talked about the, the photographs, you know, like getting an NEH digitization grant, 
you know, and working with the Schomburg and maybe Howard or something, and you know, let's do the digitization of the stuff. So, you know, it, it brings Bennett further out um, and it makes it more available, you know, to scholars around the world. You know, then that's great. You know, if we get more people coming to Howard because she was a, you know, faculty member here, um, you know, and they are like, this is great, this is wonderful. How about I give you a donation of like a million dollars? Sure, let's do that. You know, like let's try to do, um, you know, more. And I think another reason I really like doing stuff with with Bennett and Spencer in particular is, you know, their love of HBCUs, the, the working with African American communities. And again, you know, I work at an HBCU. This is. Um, you know, it's very important to who I am as a as an instructor um, and as a researcher. So I think it's um, yeah, always other projects. Yep. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very. I'm going. I'm going there. I'm going there. Thank you very much for 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 coming to address us and to, and you know present what you have found, selected writings and the the photographs and her, and her life story, which you've put together, mm -hmm. all in one place about Gwendolyn Bennett. We really appreciate it, and we will give her a round of applause. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's still snacks back there, guys, so please yes. help yourselves. And, and Professor Willer also has books uh, for sale uh, if you would like to uh, purchase a book. We have them in the bookstore as well. And if you have any questions for, uh, you yep. know, after after session questions, please please approach her. Okay. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. It's great. This is one of our, our interns actually ah. at one time. Yeah. Yes. Marquise. What, what's your name? Marquise. Marquise. Okay. Awesome. Lovely to meet you. Yes, I definitely.